Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo, bros, it's Yo Elliot here back again with the Elliot Hulse podcast. And it's been amazing speaking with you guys about various different topics, but I always seem to get really cool guests that are in the area. And as a result, I asked them if they'll show up and come talk to us on the show. And so today I got another bro by the name of Zuby. And I think a lot of you guys probably know who Zuby is. Zuby showed up in Florida uh, a couple days ago and gave a speech at a university near me. And uh, it was amazing. We're going to dive into that and some other things too. Zuby is a fitness expert, right? And so right up our alley, right up my alley, same kind of dude that loves to pump iron and get strong and be fit and healthy. Uh, fits perfectly with what we talk about. Uh, also a rapper, and a political commentator, is that fair to say? Yeah, social, cultural commentator primarily. Um, you know, a man who tries to speak the truth and seek the truth and not so much be a guide to people. That's not what I've set out to be per se, but I think a lot of people see me in that way. Some people would call yeah. me a philosopher or someone who's just trying to make sense of the world. Well, you are a beacon of light and people will be attracted to the light. The light also pisses some people off as well. <laughs> I have a sure. teacher that once said that if you uh, show up in a dark cave with a bright light, there are going to be people that want to annihilate that mm. light, right? Because they're used to the darkness and you're like, it just hurt their eyes. And there were some people yesterday who your eyes was hurting. We'll talk about that in a moment. But just for those uh, who don't know about you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into the work that you got into, and then we'll move on from there, brother. Yeah, sure thing, bro. So Zuby, independent rapper, author, host of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast, coach, public speaker. I do a lot of different things. People know me for different things. I was born in the UK. My family background is originally from Nigeria. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I lived there for 20 years. Went to boarding school from a young age at 11 in the UK. So I was back and forth between the two countries a lot. Did really well in school. I studied at Oxford University. Got my degree in computer science from there when I was 20 years old. And that's also where I fell in love with music and started rapping. I released my first album when I was 19. And then I went full time with my music in 2011. So for the past 11 years at this point, I've been crafting out my own lane. So from 2011 to 2018, I was just known as a musician. I was just traveling around the UK all the time, performing, selling my CDs on the street, doing pop-up shops in different shopping malls, just building my, up my audience, doing the putting in the legwork. I mean, I've spoken to over half a million people, I would estimate, in order to sell tens of thousands of albums independently. And then in 2019, I started to become known for some aspects of social and cultural commentary. I started commenting more on just what I'm seeing in the world and sharing my views and my opinions more outside my music, primarily through Twitter. And in February 2019, I had my first super viral international tweet which was when I chose to identify as a woman and I broke the British women's deadlift record. Right. And this video got millions upon millions of views. It put me on the radar of everyone from uh, Ben Shapiro to Joe Rogan to Tucker Carlson to Piers Morgan to just millions of people across the world. And there was a big media reaction to it as well. So that was the discovery moment for a lot of people. That's when a lot of people first discovered me. And then people saw, oh, okay, cool. He does music as well. Oh, he's got this podcast going. I wrote and released my first book that, that uh, year and so on. So three and a half years later now, it wasn't just a flash in the pan that then fizzled out off of that single tweet. It was an introduction to people, to myself. So it wasn't just the tweet went viral. I myself kind of went viral. And since then, things have just been going from strength to strength. And I've been traveling around the world and reaching people through all these different mediums and just doing my best to positively impact and inspire people through my words, which is why I wanted to become a rapper in the first place. 
Amazing, bro. I, I just want to thank you for reaching out to me when you came here. 100%, bro. Right? It's kind of strange. We spoke, uh, I guess, 2020 on your show. Yeah, yeah, 2020. It was, it was 2020 or 2020 last year or the year before. One yeah, it was yeah. shortly after the world started going haywire. Yes, probably 2020. Then. Right, yeah. which was like on its way, but it's like we hit a point. We mm -hmm. hit a peak point at that uh, during 2020. Yeah. Uh, I want to backtrack for a moment and ask you about rap. Sure. Uh, what was your inspiration? Who were your inspirations? Who did you listen to growing up that made you say, hey, I think I can do this? Yeah, sure. So it's funny because when I was a child, I didn't, I wasn't into music so much. I played piano. I used to do piano recitals and stuff like that. Really? Yeah. And I played trombone for a little while, but I wasn't a music fan in terms of listening to stuff. That started when I went to boarding school when I was 12, 13 years old. And then especially in my mid-teen years, I really just became an avid hip hop fan. Um, at that time, I was listening to a lot of Nas, Jay-Z, Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, Eminem was blowing up at that time. That was really the rise of Eminem and peak Eminem. And then now, you you're had, a little bit younger than me, yeah. but were you buying CDs? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay. All of them. What was your All first rap CD that you bought? LL Cool J the Goat. All right. Was it a tape or a CD? CD. I don't even remember. CD. Okay, yeah. cool. My first was a tape. Yeah, I'm a little bit older. So uh, my first was Digital Underground, the Humpty okay. Dance. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then, uh, and then Public Enemy. Okay. Yeah. So between myself and my friends, you got to remember, I was in boarding school and you've got people from all over the world. We're all there. I'm in an all boys boarding house. How did you and go from Nigeria to boarding school in the UK? So I've never, I never lived in Nigeria. Um, my older siblings and my parents did for some time. But we moved to Saudi Arabia when I was a baby. So all my earliest memories were in Saudi Arabia. We lived there because, really? we, yeah, my dad's a medical doctor. He's a physician. And he got a job opportunity to work there. And we went there and ended up staying for 20 years. So I had a mixed upbringing. People always get confused by my accent because people hear I'm from the UK. And then they're like, wait, you sound American. And that's from going to school in Saudi Arabia up until fifth grade. And then funnily enough, even when I went to boarding school in the UK, I didn't want to lose my accent. So it softened a little. My accent, I don't think sounds 100% American, but it's probably more American than it is British. But I'm the only person in my family who has this accent. <laughs> so, I, so I just sound different. I just sound like me. And it causes a lot of confusion whether I'm in the UK or I'm in the US. But that's the story of it. So I'm a British, Nigerian who grew up in Saudi Arabia and went to an American school for a while before going to British schools and a British university. That's amazing. So your dad's a physician. Why did your family move around so much? Well, actually, we didn't move so much. I mean, we lived in Saudi. Well, okay. we, we, lived, we lived in Saudi. So before that time, Why my parents Saudi? spent time. You know Aramco? No. Aramco is the second biggest company in the entire world after Apple. They kind of go back and forth between those two. It's the biggest oil company in the world and one of the biggest companies in the world. And there's a lot of people from a lot of different countries who work out there. Uh, massive oil and natural gas company. And my dad was a doctor. He was a doctor for them. So I'm what some people would call an Aramco brat. So people who spend their childhood in an Aramco camp are called Aramco brats. There's lots of them here in the USA. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm one of those. How many siblings do you have? Four. So you're the youngest of four. Youngest of five. Youngest of five. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you got yeah. four siblings. That's amazing. I'm yeah. the oldest of four. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, your mom, I, I assume you had an intact family your whole yeah, life? Yeah, very much so, still do. What a blessing. It's a huge blessing. I think my parents will soon be coming up on 50 years together. 50 yeah. years married, yeah. Uh, what did your mom do? My mom was a journalist for some time. Now she does some, she does some magistrate work now, but she was a journalist, and then in Saudi she worked in the community information center and she did some writing there as well uh, so you had two professional parents yeah. did you ever, ever watch the cosby show a little i'm familiar with it to some degree i'm yeah. not super familiar when i was in saudi we'd sometimes get some of the american tv programming so mm -hmm. i'm somewhat familiar with both british and american tv mm -hmm. so i watched it a little but i was never like a huge fan of it or something. I don't know. I grew up watching a lot of Cosby show. Okay. And it was unique because it was a show that portrayed black people in America as professional, mm -hmm. uh, conservative, mm -hmm. you know, family focused, um, far stretched from what we get in TV today, uh, both black and white. Yeah. Uh, growing up, 
as a black man, but ob- abroad and but familiar with American culture, what would you say are some of the differences between uh, American black American culture and your experience as an African man living through Europe and the Middle East and stuff? Wow. I think that's a tricky one because I think a lot of what is the way black Americans or even black American culture is portrayed through the media, whether that's modern day TV or music and so on, I don't think it's an accurate representation of the typical actual black American person. Mm -hmm. I think there are certain stereotypes and ways of making black men and black women come across, which yes, there are people who are like that, but they're not really sharing the whole picture. They're not showing the, you know, normal, they're not showing the the average family oriented person who's just, you know, going to work and not being a degenerate in any type of way. And I think a lot of the degeneracy gets promoted and pushed and that's not unique to black people, it is across the spectrum. But I think that through various mechanisms, there are certain portrayals of black Americans in particular, which get pushed through the media, not just here in the USA, by the way, but Mm -hmm. internationally. And they, it sort of fortifies certain stereotypes, which I think oftentimes are not, number one, are not accurate. I think it's an imbalanced representation, but also not exactly wholesome or positive. Um, And I think there's over the past few decades, it seems like there's been a move intentionally or not, or maybe both to reinforce certain negative stereotypes. And I know that most Americans don't leave the USA and don't travel and perhaps do not see how those how those images and views are get ingrained uh, around the world. Right. Like African right? blacks are different than American blacks. Mm-hmm. My country, my parents are Caribbean. We're okay. mixed. Yeah. Uh, but Jamaicans, Haitians, Caribbean black people are different uh, in many ways, mm-hmm. of values and culture. Uh, I, I Dare I say they take themselves uh, more seriously mm. than American blacks. How, how much would you say... Uh, Rap music Mm. has impacted American black culture and of course, you know, the world because we export our media in a in a positive way. Yeah. But then also in a negative way. It's hard, man. It's a it's a complicated question because I'm very aware that we're talking about tens and some in some instances, hundreds of millions of people. So, I mean, there's about what, 40 million or so black Americans in the USA. That's a that's a nation's worth of people, a pretty large nation's worth of people. So I'm somewhat hesitant to, you know, I'm very much an individualist on, mm-hmm. on many levels. So I don't like to make broad statements of like, oh, okay, you know, black Americans are like this, or this is the conception around the moment, because it, it's, it's too big a group and with so much diversity and different types of people in it that just like I wouldn't do the same with you know, Asian Americans or white Americans or Jewish Americans. What it's, it's, it's such a big group. But I think that in terms, of the, in terms of rap culture, it's simultaneously a reflection and also something that does shape culture and perception. So it's both. It's kind of this, this chicken and the egg thing, right? Does art influence life? Does life influence art? And I think it's, it's both. It's both, right? If you look at hip hop, whether you're looking at, you know, gangster rap and the stuff that's more in that vein, or if you're looking at stuff that's just more, uh, even what people might have called conscious hip hop or stuff that's more political, you talked about public enemy and so on. It's simultaneously a reflection. There's a level of narrative and reporting to it of like, look, this is what's going on in the street, this is what's happening in the community, this is what's going on in Brooklyn, this is what's happening in LA, this is what's happening uh, down south in Texas or whatever. So there's some element which is a reflection of the way those individuals and people in those communities have grown up and the things that they've experienced and been through. But then there's also the power of hip hop to shape culture. One of the most powerful things about hip hop and rap music is 
it's one of the things that is globally around the world, it's considered pretty much the epitome of cool, right? Rap and hip hop can make stuff cool. Rappers are considered cool. They're considered ahead of the game. You know, young people especially gravitate towards anything that they consider cool. And with that, it does have a lot of powerful influence, which can be either positive or negative. Because I think something incredibly important if you think about different cultures is what does a culture or a community consider cool? And I think that whatever is considered cool, you're going to get more young people emulating that. So if you look at a community where the cool thing is to have a family and to be well-educated and to you know be a law-abiding citizen and to be responsible and so on, if that's what's considered cool and aspirational, naturally you're going to get more young people emulating that and gravitating towards it. If on the flip side, you took a community and the things that are considered cool are doing drugs or selling drugs or having a criminal record or going to prison is considered cooler than going to university or having five children from five different women is considered cooler than having five children from one woman and so on, then you're going to get more people emulating that behavior. Again, especially young people who are most likely to be influenced. So I know that there are millions and millions of people who fall into different categories on this on all sides of the spectrum and across different races and ethnicities and nationalities and so on. But I think the real power of hip hop beyond the the messaging is its ability to shape and influence what is considered cool. And I think anyone who's a, who's a fan of hip hop actually knows how influential it can be, right? If you're right. A, a teenager and you're a rap fan, it's going to influence the way you dress, maybe the way you speak, the slang that you're using. It doesn't mean that you're going to go and imitate and mimic every single thing that you're hearing a rapper say on record. But I would absolutely be lying if I said that hip hop didn't have like, of course, hip hop had a massive influence on me. Would you say young. that American culture, Americans in general, would be more virtuous with or without rap? <sighs> wow. I honestly do not know. And I don't just say rap, yeah. but I'm talking, you know, most pop music, pop music most in general. cool music. This is the thing because it does reflect society. This music is not coming out of, it's not coming out of nowhere. And people are not generally, people are generally choosing what they listen to. People choose what they can consume, right? Is this that is, so? I mean... I do think so. I, think I grew up in a time where mm. we listened to whatever was on the radio. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of mold to believe what was cool based on what they were pumping into our brains. That's true. And I think that is more true of the past than now. Mm -hmm. I think that now most people are choosing, very much choosing what they listen to, whether it's on Spotify or it's on Apple Music or iTunes. People are very much curating their own playlists. They're searching for what they want. They're seeking out. It's not, it's not just the radio mm -hmm. and the nightclubs pushing stuff on you. So I think there's a I think there's a responsibility on all sides of it, mm -hmm. right? I think it's interesting. I get asked as a rapper, I get a lot of people asking me things like, you know, do you think rappers are a positive or a negative uh, role models, or do you think that you know why do rappers make music with so much profanity, or why do they rap about these topics and so on? And I think those are interesting questions. I think a more interesting question is why do so many people like it? Right, like right. What it, a lot of it is I consumer think, driven. If I would just, if I would mm. interject there with why mm. most people like it, I think it's because of our fallen nature. There's a there's a propensity towards sin. Mm. So anything that's sensual, sexy, mm -hmm. that gives me a sense of liberation, yes. makes me feel proud, pride, mm -hmm. uh, will always, will always sink to that lowest tier. Yeah, you know that's that's in our nature. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you. And I think that's, and I think it's interesting to recognize it because it makes us turn that focus back inwards, right? As critical as I can be of certain rappers and their lyrics and the messaging they're putting out there and so on, I would be a hypocrite if I said, oh, I don't listen to any gangster rap or I don't listen to any DJ. I mean, it makes you feel powerful. I, I yeah. grew up listening to Biggie and yeah. Tupac yeah. and Nas, like you mm -hmm. said before, uh, some of the older stuff. But it gives you this sense of pride. Yes. I mean, that's the main thing. I remember listening to rap music, especially if I want to get pumped up mm -hmm. for a football game or something. It makes me feel powerful. It's powerful. To listen to this music. Um, and I think it's, and I think how you channel that is extraordinary. I think it's extraordinarily important. I think that can be channeled in a very negative way. 
it can also be channeled in a very positive way. So I know for myself, I mean, I find when I'm listening to even some of these same artists, the message I'm getting from it or what I'm taking away from it is when it filters through my lens, it's primarily positive, right? Because number one, I'm from a very solid family, thank God, and right. I was raised well with certain decency and morals. There's no, mu- there's no movie, there's no song, there's no video game that's gonna make me go out there and do something heinous. Which I like, I don't even cuss, right? Like, I can listen to cussing mm-hmm. all day; it and won't so even make me. You mentioned a blessing that yeah. you have, which you came from a solid family. Yes. Would you say that rap music uh, has fostered an environment in our cult- in our culture mm-hmm. where it has been detrimental to the family? Um, I'll be honest. I think if so, I think it's very much pales in comparison to many other factors out there. I think that it's, uh, look, I I recognize that music has the power to alter people's emotions and feelings and to motivate and inspire people in different ways. I'm an artist who makes music that's focused on positivity and uplifting people and trying to inspire and motivate people and put certain messages out there. And I know for a fact that that has an effect on people. Mm-hmm. I've met people. I've had people tell me that song of yours or you know that thing you've said, that performance you did, it had this effect on me in a positive way. So logically, if it's possible for music to impact people in a positive way, obviously it can impact people in a negative way. I'd be being mm-hmm. dishonest if I said, oh, no, that's not possible. Something like the... The breakdown of family, um, fatherless, fatherlessness and so on, divorce rates, all these other things that have been, you know, honestly, I think is probably the biggest problem in the, this entire country. Um, do I think that rap music is even in the top five, top 10 causes of that or sources? No, not at all. I don't think so. Um, but... Could it possibly have some detrimental effect, especially on younger people if they're not raised well? Yeah, possibly. Um, and, yeah. It, and it depends on the artist as well, because even if we're saying rap and hip hop, I think we're, well, t- we're I, talking I about a specific part of it. pop culture. Yeah. Right, yeah. because it's rap, but it's all the music, punk rock mm-hmm. music, all this music that, in my opinion, is degenerate and mm-hmm. derogatory mm-hmm. and destroys us from the inside out. You know, It's a cultural war when it really boils down to it. People are going to make choices on who they vote for and what they choose to do, mm-hmm. but it's really been an attack on our soul. Mm-hmm. And you can't argue. I mean, even the word music comes from musing, right? Like, so speaking into the soul, mm-hmm. you know, hearing from the, it's spiritual. Uh, you spoke yesterday about uh, freedom of speech. I remember in the late 80s or early 90s, Ice-T came out with an album. Mm. And of course, I was a young kid. I wanted to hear all the bad stuff. Anything that just sounded raunchy and made my parents upset was going to make <laughs> me happy. I love Wu-Tang. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really get to Ice-T because I was on the East Coast. Mm. That was more West Coast stuff. But there was a big pushback at the time because the name of his album was Cop Killer. Yes. Now, that sounds kind of... That's, that's pretty mild today, given that we have you know, much worse, much more diabolical music, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But that brought up the issue of should this rap music be allowed in our culture? And there were people that were pushing back at the time. Um, What are your thoughts on that? Like, you spoke about freedom of speech. Is there some speech that should be curbed because it creates vice and error in a culture? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I'm very anti-censorship. I think that the existing laws that exist in the USA in regards to freedom of speech are pretty close to where they should be with, you know, very limited and specific limitations, direct calls and threats to, you know, credible threats of violence, um, you know, promoting, I guess, like terror, terroristic activity um, in a credible fashion, things like libel, slander, false advertising, you know, rec- reckless endangerment. People like always like say, you know, yelling fire when there's no fire in a, a crowded theater. Mm-hmm. That's the thing people always say. I think those very slight limitations are kind of the best we can do. I think freedom of speech is, freedom in general is a, first of all, it's always, there's always going to be trade-offs. There's always going to be trade-offs then there's always going to be things which are just 
enforceable and not. But then I think the biggest problem is always if you're going to consider something offensive or objectionable, I think the biggest issue there is that it's just so subjective. It's incredibly subjective and that there's no person who can be on authority and the absolute morality on what is quote unquote harmful or quote unquote offensive, right? Obviously, I spoke at the university and you were there and Mm -hmm. there were people there who did not want me to be allowed to speak because to them, whether or not they're even familiar with me, they had somehow decided that I'm quote unquote dangerous or I'm putting students at risk or I'm somehow... I'm I'm hateful or I'm offensive, all, all these type of words. And we all have our different sensibilities and our belief systems and the things that we stand for and the things that we're against and so on based on our families, our religion, our culture, our nation, our values, our individual, our personality types, our experiences. And so if you were to go down a road of, okay, anything that offends someone or potentially offends someone that's, that's that's subjective. Yeah, it, it's it's incredibly subjective, and it, it it quickly it quickly can descend into tyranny. And mm-hmm. this has happened. I mean, it exists in some parts right. around the world. You know, you're not allowed to say, "Act." You can't criticize the political class. You can't say anything you against the you know people's religious beliefs or even not follow them. You can't say this. You can't say that. You can't say that. And it, very quickly, it's like, well, we've all got our things. Right. There's a lot of stuff I see and I hear every mm-hmm. single day on social media, yeah. online, offline. There's stuff I see every day which offends me. But yeah. I'm also a grown man and I'm mature and Do I don't think you can nerf the world. In uh, Okay, so feelings are subjective yeah. and being offended is a feeling. Yeah. You choose to be offended. Mm. Do you believe that there is objective truth? Yes. And do you believe that it is the responsibility of leaders to steer people away from, or let me put it this way, steer people towards truth and away from error. Yes. Given that, do you think that, and we see the the ultimate end of liberal democracy with what we're experiencing in this inversion Mm -hmm. of the freedom of speech where uh, truth is actually being censored Mm -hmm. And uh, degeneracy is being upholded, mm-hmm. and most of the de- degeneracy is a byproduct of our of our craving for sin, for uh, sensuality, mm-hmm. for quote unquote freedom. Uh, we have Kanye Ye- Kanye West right now, yay, and he came up preaching a whole lot of things that were fun to listen to, but also in error, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but today he finds himself in a bind because he's being criticized for speaking truth. I guess my question or even, you know, what I'm proposing is that we've gotten to a point where the freedom of speech, liberty, uh, because in my opinion is, is, uh, erroneous. I, I think freedom, I think the I think freedom of speech is wrong. Okay, I think there needs to be a limit what's your, what's your position on freedom on of speech. Okay. But I'll tell you why. Okay. Because what we see today is the byproduct of unrestrained freedom of speech, where now the very weapon by which we were able to uh, achieve virtue and liberation has mm-hmm. now been turned around and is being used uh, in it, like guns. Mm-hmm. Guns can be used to liberate and to free, yes, but also can be used to create chaos. Agreed. And so the, the, the place where we find ourselves in, which is the ultimate logical end of unrestrained freedom of speech is where now those who are in complete error are free to speak and you can speak as much error as you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can speak as much degeneracy and debauchery mm-hmm. uh, as you want. You could pump this into the brains of our children through hypnotic music. Mm-hmm. But the minute someone like Ye or anybody else uh, speaks out in a way that that questions the narrative and proposes perhaps a more virtuous truth is now taken down. Mm-hmm. So would you say that given that full liberation of freedom of speech, we have now found ourselves in uh, in a place where it has rotten our culture? I can understand the perspective, but I think it is far better than the alternative. I think it's far better than the alternative. I I don't think it's that dissimilar to the arguments that a lot of people who want gun control or out control gun bans, for example, in the USA 
I don't think it's dissimilar to the argument they would use, which is that guns are guns. Guns are dangerous, um, and there's there's a lot of them out there, and some people do bad things with them far more than you you know are doing with words. Right? There are people who will go out and commit a mass shooting or murder someone or go into school and do this, and so therefore that freedom is too dangerous to exist. So we need to curb that freedom. We need to take an authoritarian approach and punish everybody and restrict and limit everybody in the name of safety or security. It's the exact same thing they did during the pandemic, right? They said that, well, freedom is too dangerous, right? They started calling it freedom, D-U-M-B, right? All you people advocating, you know, against the mandates and against the lockdowns and against the that's fact. using the weapon against the people yeah in that, a negative way yeah that that but that's using the language of safety and security to curb basic individual rights and right. liberties and i think which that is mostly as born a, out of uh, of fear a which fear. is an emotion as, as fear yes absolutely so whilst i can understand people saying that well with freedom of speech you know that means that someone can you know use that nasty word or someone can say this or someone can say that and you know i don't like i don't like all speech there's a lot of stuff that's out there that i don't like there's lots of art that exists that i don't consume there's a lot of music that's out there that i don't consume a lot of books i don't want to read things i don't want to consume but i don't think that means that because it offends my personal sensibilities then no one else should be allowed to consume it or or speak it number one i i mean that i don't i don't even think it's enforceable if you even truly wanted to. And also who would be the arbiter? If you think the arbiter of this realistically would be the people in the political system, it would be the same politicians and bureaucrats who are making all of these bad decisions. I can't think of a single politician who I would trust to determine what language, what speech is permissible and what is not, what is safe and what is dangerous and so on, right? They'll, they'll be gunning for us. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, pfft, you know, you think they're going at Kanye? They'll be good. They'll be going. They'll yeah. be going. They'd be going at everybody. They'd be I like, no. Who you was know? it? Was one of the uh, French revolutionists, I yeah. think. Which you know, that's a topic all of his own. Who said uh, the pen is mightier than the sword? Mm -hmm. And so we have common sense. And I'm not going with a political position on it, but there's rules about using a gun. You don't yes. put a gun in somebody's hand unless you explain to them the power of it, how to use it safely, mm -hmm. how to use it properly, how not to hurt you know, how not to harm yes. and what it's really made for. Um, we also have one of our founding fathers, I think it might have been Hamilton, I don't know, uh, who said that our form of government, which was supposed to be a republic, um, will only stand in an environment that has morality, mm -hmm. moral people. I don't got the exact quote. I think it's, but, it's, it's uh, for a moral and religious people and completely insufficient to any other something like that. Right, so we have freedom of speech, but yet we have no moral code, we have no moral law, we have no moral uh, 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 boundaries mm -hmm. in our culture. And you can see that because can, you look at the media. Can, can I, let me, I, I would push back on that a little. I think at the extremes, there is some truth to that. But when I exist in the real world and I travel around the USA and I meet people and I talk to people and I interact and I observe people, I do think that most people have pretty solid moral and ethical codes and boundaries. I do completely agree that there's some real degeneracy and inversion that is being pushed out there. And some of it is in the mainstream. Some of it's now in the schools and in the universities and so on. I, we, we're very aware of that. But when I see the typical person, the, uh, the average American or the average British person and so on, they're not so far unmoored from are from morality and decency and ethics. I mean, I, if, if we were, I think things would look far, far, far more chaotic. You'd go out there on the street and it would just be, it would be lawlessness. It would be mayhem. People would just be uh, attacking from each other, not you know violating each other all the time. I go out there, people are generally being respectful and polite. Um, even when we talk about some of the extreme degenerate issues and you ask people their thoughts on, I'm not meeting a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, I think that's would Good. you say that uh, most people behave as if morality is subjective? Or do you believe that morality is objective? I think that morality is, honestly, I think that there's, I think there's stuff that's black and white. I think there's stuff that's objective. I do think that there are some things where you can always think of situations and areas where things do become more gray. There are, situ there are various situations 
on various levels where something, for example, that is, say, say you take something that would typically be considered wrong and immoral and a sin. We can probably um, imagine a situation where, from a moral perspective, it would be it would be gray, right? So, say something like telling a lie, right, or something even greater, stealing, right? We would all generally agree that it's wrong to tell a lie; it's immoral; it's a sin; it's wrong to steal. We could probably also, with our intellect, think of a situation where telling a lie may be justified and could even be the correct and moral thing to do, right? Exceptions. We could also think of a situation where perhaps stealing something, right? If you've got a, well, this person is going to starve if I don't, I haven't got the money here. If I, if I don't take this thing and give this to this person, this person's going to starve to death. I think most people would agree, okay, in that situation, the the the, the greater sin would be to let this individual starve rather than to steal. steal. And so I think, I think that there are I do certainly believe in objective morality. I do think that there is some gray, there are gray areas. There are gray areas and there are situations where, depending on how someone views the world and the specific situation and what's at hand, it's a, you know, the trolley problem situation where it's like, mm. well, is that, you can, you can argue both sides. Okay, I think that's the better option or I think that's the better option. I, I don't know. This is not a, you know, there's no good place to stand in a massacre. This is a gray, this is a morally gray zone. Well, would you say that morality has to be based on truth for it to actually be moral? That's a great question. I mean, if we're talking about some type of ultimate or universal truth, then my gut is leaning towards yes. Yeah. Um, but that's one I'd need to. And would you say that that would more. be well, it would mostly rest on natural law? Yeah. Right. Stuff that we can see. So yesterday you gave a talk on freedom of speech, and boy, there was a big crowd outside. Mm -hmm. All these kids who felt morally justified by objecting towards you. Yes. Um, they had their quote unquote truth, mm -hmm. which, in my opinion, was is just based on pure false mm -hmm. uh, error. Um, not based on the natural law, immoral, mm -hmm. most of their ideas, but yet they're given a free uh, pass to spread these ideas and to be justified in arguing, fighting, mm -hmm. and pro proposing these untruthful, subjective, immoral, against the natural law mm -hmm. ideas. Do you think that we would be better off if those ideas were, well, we, it almost seems like conservatives don't fight. I don't know, mm -hmm. it's weird. But we're, we're silenced for the, for the virtue of the good of society. No, I don't think so, because that is the exact way that they think. They just think of it the other way around. And I'd rather not have anyone have that ring of power. I think you I think you have to be very careful to not use or want to wield weapons and power that you would not want used against you. So I think if you enable for exam, example censorship and deplatforming that very much cuts both ways, right? So just if there were a an objectionable speaker to my mind going on a university campus who's promoting some stuff that I think is degenerate who who just holds holds views that are very much um, opposed to some of my own or some of my own sensibilities. Mm -hmm. If I were to try to, you know, push to get that person deplatformed and censored and so on, then I now don't really have a leg to stand on when someone, you know, the university wants to invite a, a, a Christian pastor who's, you know, a strong Bible believing Christian and is talking about those, and they want to then deplatform that individual because they're claiming that that person is is hateful or is bigoted or is you know anti this or anti that i think it's a it's a very dangerous weapon and i'd rather that tool just not be available i also in the long term by the way i also think that in the long term the truth wins in the long term the truth wins yeah. and i think that some ideas are genuinely better than others so i think that with freedom and with liberty Okay, let's 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 run the simulation. Let's let this game play. Let's let people who who are living in untruth 
and promoting untruth and living through this inversion. Let's see. I mean, you can already see that those are not happy individuals. They're they're not happy. No, no, they're they're not happy. (laughs) They're not successful. They're not having great families and they're not enjoying life in the way they could, which is why they're always mad at everyone else. Um, You know, but it's like, okay, if you if you choose to live that way, see how that works out. And then you'll have other people who are like, you know what, I'm going to be a little a little more traditional and a little more you know conservative and do things the way things have normally been done and Mm -hmm. do my best to live in truth and by objective reality. And I do strongly believe that over time, I think we're already seeing it, that that latter group ends up being more successful, more content with life, more happy, quite literally is more likely to go on and reproduce and to actually have children and have families and so on. And so I think you can, I think you can deny reality. But I don't think you can deny, deny the consequences of denying reality. You can say, "Oh, the table is square. It's a per, it's purple, and you know this is this, and you're you're a, you're a woman, and I'm a this and this." You can you can say all that, but at some point the rubber's going to meet the road, and reality kicks in. Someone can say, "Oh, you know, I don't think there's any difference between men and women, right?" Or I think that uh, someone yesterday was saying that they think males should be able to compete with females in sport. Right. And it was a, it was a female saying it. Right. Right. And it's like, OK, you OK, let's 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 play it out. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. You want to let males compete with you. I can guarantee you in a decade there will be no females in sport. There right. will be no females in college level, school level, right. professional level sport like so that destroys. I mean, yeah. I, I propose that it's their freedom of speech, which is destroying like mm-hmm. so for example is it a, is it our responsibility uh, of course as families but we see what happens to the family mm-hmm. but as leaders uh, pillars in society corporations uh the media and so forth to protect our children from these erroneous ideas it is i think so um i'm not a parent yet and i think that for people who are living right now in the modern western world this is this is a big a big challenge because you're having to push back against certain elements of culture in an uphill battle that I don't think you previously had to. So I do certainly think that it's a I do certainly think that it's a challenge and I think yes, parents do right now as always have a duty to do best by their children. By the way, I also think that people who are sane and normal and living in truth and living with morality and others, need to be more bold mm. and need to be more courageous and need to speak up more, right? Think of how bold and courageous those people were yesterday, right? Right? Like they're very bold. You're, you're complete. I'm like, wow, you're, you're, you're wrong, but you're, you're passionate yeah. and you're outspoken and you're willing to stand up for what you believe in. Even Why if, do you think I, that is? That, that I, those who are in error mm. seem to be much more bold than those who are, are living in truth? I think it's multiple things. I think that most people, firstly, I do believe that most people are still sane. And most people really kind of just want to get on with life. They want to work and earn money and be reasonably healthy, take care of their kids, pay off their mortgage, pay their rent, not be in debt, go to school. Like most people largely don't really want to be bothered. They just want to be, you know, just like, leave me alone. Let me live. Make sure, you know, they want the roads to work, the electricity to mm-hmm. function and so on. They're not culture warriors. They're not there like, oh, I want to fight this political battle or social battle. They, most people generally have an aversion to that. And I would say conservative minded people in particular, almost by definition, generally are OK and happy with the status quo and typically want to, you know, maintain. They want to they want to conserve. They want mm-hmm. to preserve. They're not as activist minded. They're not pushing for change, pushing for change, pushing for change. So I think that people on the left side of the political aisle, especially the more activist minded one, because they're focused on change, there's more of an there's more of a push to be an activist because you're trying to have change. I mean, mm-hmm. if conservatives even had a slogan or a chant, I mean, what would you even be chanting? Like conserve, conserve, keep keep, keep things, things the, the way same. they are. Yeah. Right? <laughs> things change. are fine. Yeah. Why are we changing them? Yeah, and there there's something about that that both from a the individual perspective, but also to any sort of group or collective, that's not exactly, uh, I mean, think for an 18-year-old college student, that's not exactly a, a sexy a sexy message or something that's attractive. And when you're young, especially a bit more rebellious, you want to change the status quo. Mm-hmm. You know, you're living in a slightly different world from your parents and so I on. I almost see this pendulum so, swinging here now where yeah. traditionalism is like the new is the new rebellion. Agreed. Right? So we're seeing a fraction of Gen Z mostly. Mm-hmm. 
uh, making a call back to the way things were, right? Yes. They're becoming more conservative, religious conservative. And it's almost like that's a rebellion against their boomer and Gen X uh, parents. Mm -hmm. Not being a degenerate is the new counterculture. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, and I, that's, I've seen this in my own life as well because, you know, I've been, I put out my first album way back in 2006. And for the first 10 years of my music career, first eight years at least, because I don't cuss, I talk about positive stuff, I, you know, I have no degenerate messaging in my music, I never have, I don't talk about gang banging or drugs or, you know, how many women, whatever, champagne, Ferraris, like whatever, I've never talked about any of that stuff. And one of the greatest criticisms of my music then, and even still now to some degree, is that it's too, it's too milk toast. it's too Will Smith, it's too like, it's too sanitary, it's too clean. Right. And for a long time to a lot of people, I was considered almost kind of like boring. Mm -hmm. Right. Some people thought it was boring. It's not spicy enough. And so it's kind of interesting how in the past few years, I am now deemed by some people as, ooh, controversial. Ooh, Zuby's yes. Zuby's a bit controversial. Yeah, he's quite, he's quite like, my views haven't changed. I've right. just been, I've been here the whole time. What's happened is you said the world has shifted. I've just kind of generally stayed still. And things have moved so far off base by sim that by simply speaking the truth or trying to and spreading a positive message, it cuts through and people are like, whoa, I think the same thing happened with Jordan Peterson. I think jo if Jordan Peterson was around in 1995 or even perhaps 2005, people would be like, okay, he's an interest, good lecturer, a good speaker, but he's not saying anything that profound or right. stuff that we don't know. Whereas now it's, it's like, rebellious. no, but now you've had, you know, generations, many millions of people growing up without fathers or father figures, people living in this age of everything is gray men, more that morality, uh, my truth, his truth, her truth, your truth, and so on. So to have this man stand up and just say some basic, yeah. re almost remind people of some of these basic lessons, have personal responsibility, clean your room, stand up straight with your shoulders back, right? right? Uh, Marry the woman that you're having sex with. Right? And it's like, whoa, that's, that's powerful. That's profound. I, I needed that. I needed someone to tell me to carry a load and to not wallow in my own sadness as a man and to improve myself and to do this. So those type of messages. And if you're looking at people who are who are blowing up in many ways, it's people who are speaking that message in their own unique way. We, we all have different personalities and different ways of messaging, but whether someone looks at a, a Jordan Peterson or a Joe Rogan, even an Andrew Tate, whether, whatever people think of him, or yourself, myself, it's David Goggins. Like it's, it's actually quite a similar message, very much about critical thinking, personal responsibility and personal accountability. The fact that the government's not going to save you, you can't blame all your problems on other people. It's up to you as a man, as a woman, carry your load, take care of yourself, get your body in order, get your life in order, get your finances in order, get your own house in order before you go out there and want to scream at everyone else and criticize everyone, you know, internal locus of control. And we're now living in a time where that is deemed by some people to be controversial because they've promoted this idea of entitlement and nothing is your fault and the world should completely morph and cater to you and your feelings and your sensibilities rather than you develop yourself to be to be strong enough to handle views that you don't like or hear someone say something that you find objectionable and not to you know sc sc scream and you know become <laughs> someone <laughs> like 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 these type of activists and so on and i think that people have just been coddled for so long that i do think that the pendulum is swinging back i do uh, here here's something i think and some people do disagree with me on this, but I believe that we have passed peak woke. Yeah. I think we've passed peak woke. And when I say that, I don't mean that it's all over or there's not going to be any more foolishness and stupidity and clown world stuff. But I think the implicit and explicit tolerance and support for it has passed its peak. I think that if you go back to 2017, 2018, fewer people were even really aware of a lot of the stuff that was going on. And they were just like, oh, you know, everything's fine. They were kind of sleepwalking a bit. And I think that the Trump effect woke people up, the Brexit effect in the UK woke people up, the pandemic situation and the way that was handled woke people up, 
people have a, probably an all-time low trust now in mainstream media and even in lots of these institutions, whether it's the CDC or it's the NIH or it's the WHO or it's this or it's that. People are questioning things. People are learning, oh, wait, you're teaching my kid what? Why are, why are homeschooling rates flying up, right? Parents are learning, wait, wait, when I went to school, like, you know, we didn't have to worry about all this or whatever, but some of these schools are teaching things that, like, people are waking up to it, and I'm starting to see more and more people. If you were speaking out about this stuff in 2018 it was, or 2017, it was very lonely, very, very lonely. But just in the past five years, you're seeing the, you're seeing the pushback, even on a state level, right? Here in Florida, you're seeing dissent, you know, even using the word woke, saying, no, we don't want... We don't want that, right? So I think that the the tolerance for it and people just people just going with it is has passed its peak. I'm starting to see even the New York Times the other day put out an article that was somewhat critical about giving uh, hormone blockers to children or doing like previously they were fully on board with it, but they're seeing okay. The rubber's starting to meet the road, and you're getting so many people who are pushing back and saying, "Wait, no." No, not not my, not children, not not my child, not this. You shouldn't be teaching kids this. You shouldn't be promoting that. And even the sort of center left uh, media channels and personalities are moderating their view rather than just running full steam ahead of this. They're starting to meet some resistance. And I think that that is going to lead to a pushback, which is going to get that pendulum. I've said many times that I think for the past several years, we've, we've been living in an overcorrection. Right, we've been living in an overcorrection. Certain things in the past, maybe it was too far that way, and then it corrects. And I think we hit a happy medium, maybe in the the '90s and the early thousands, and then it overcorrected the other way, where you've now got full inversion going on, and you know, truth, people claiming truth doesn't even exist, and so on. And you're starting to see people push back against that. And I think that we will. It might take it might take ten years. It might take fifteen. It doesn't mean that all this stuff is going to be buried completely, but I do genuinely believe that we're going to come back towards a happy medium. But for that to happen, people do have to speak. People do have to speak up. People do have to say when they see something that's objectionable. People do have to take action and use their words and use their actions to make sure that that actually happens. And again, if look, if every sane person in this country would be like 10%, 20% more bold and courageous, I think a lot of this stuff could be ended overnight, but people are scared. The, the issue is that people are scared. The majority of people are afraid to say a fraction of the things that I'm saying right now, say a fraction of the things that I was saying yesterday, not because it's wrong or it's even objectionable or controversial, but because there could be a backlash from a very, very small, but very, very loud and very, very aggressive minority. Why do you think, uh, I guess you would say the cultural leaders, right? Like the owners of the social media, mm -hmm. YouTube and so forth, uh, Facebook, or corporations. Why do you think it is that they lean towards the diabolical as opposed to upholding truth? Why is it that they take that side or make that mm -hmm. push? What's in it for them to disrupt our society and, and to lead us down this dark road? That's a great question. I think there, I have three answers for this actually. I think, I think there's a small number, and I think this is a minority. I think there's a minority of true believers. There's a minority of people who are, you know, followed, swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the ideological narratives and ideas. I think there's a much larger percentage of people, both at the top level and also across the general population, that are simply scared. They're scared. They don't want to be called a bigot. They don't want to be called racist. They don't want to be called a transphobe. They don't want to be called anti-LGBT. They don't want to be called any of these terms. And they know that if they criticize or do not fully go along with the woke narrative, whether it's putting up their rainbow flags all everywhere during June or all year round, whether it's posting about BLM and donating to the organization, whether it's whatever it is, um, they know that if they don't do that or if they do something opposed to it at all, they're going to get a lot of backlash. So there's a massive fear component to all of this. And then thirdly, and here's one that... um. Here, this is a little bit of a hypothesis here. I think that what I call woke capitalism is largely the result of a response to everything that happened in 2008. You remember the, remember the uh, Occupy Wall Street movements that yes. were happening? And there was a time when 
a lot of people, regardless of where they were on the political aisle, the financial system collapsed. A lot of people got screwed. A lot of people lost money and so on due to the mistakes made by the whole financial system. And people were kind of waking up and getting hip to the fact of like, wait, hang on. That's the problem. People are getting out on the street and they're protesting Wall Street. They're protesting the banks. They're protesting the way that the Fed is operating. They're, right. Right. And, I, and th- I support these things. I think these are founded in truth. Yes. And I think that that put the fear of God into some of these entities. I think uh. they, right. And I think that they realize, because if you think about it, who is the natural political opponent to a mega corporation? It's not conservatives. It's actually the lefties historically, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the leftists, it's the socialists who typically have problems with big business, big corporations, them making money hand over fist, high, high CEO pay. It's generally not people on the right who- So it sounds you know, like this is a pandering to that. Yes. I think they realized that by doing these very you know, kind of mild displays of throwing them some bones here and there, that they can keep them off their back. You know, I'll just throw, uh, throw up. Because th- it's almost like they've forgotten about the banks. Yes, they have, right? Just, just throw, throw up a rainbow. It's more important, right, for the Yeah, to we, can, we, can, we can keep, because these corporations, they're still as corporatist as possible. They're making, right. they're making massive profits. They're, the but CEOs the focus are getting is paid off people. of them. The focus is off of them. Their focus is completely off of them. Now you even have people on the left who are actively supporting and championing it's the strangest these wo- thing. corporations. So it's like, you can do this. You've got a natural enemy there. And it's like, hey, we can just do these little gestures, throw up an ad occasionally and, you know, do this, right. throw, do this occasionally. And they're going to stay off our backs. Like we could still be using slave labor in China. We could still be having little children digging up uh, coltan and other right. minerals for our phones. We could still be, you know, running, creating our shoes over here, doing this, mm-hmm. doing that. But hey, look, we put up our rainbow flag. Hey, look, BLM. Right. And People are so blindsided by the fact that they're doing these meaningless gestures that their focus is no longer on the stuff that they'd normally be critical of these corporations for. So I think that there is a strategy in it that has allowed them to continue making crazy profits and do things as they want whilst keeping the sort of true leftists at bay. And yeah, sure, in, in the meantime, you might annoy some conservatives or whatever, but they're not going to stop buying your sneakers. They're not going to stop buying your coffee. Like they're, they're still going to keep buying it. They're still going to keep going to Disney. Um, and so I think that that's one of my hypotheses on why it happened. And it also sort of explains the timing. Because if you think prior to 2008, this, all these things weren't really a thing. It's and so interesting in how that was. Well, I, yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head right now because these are people that were rebelling against righteous rebellion against things that were bad. But it's the same people that boggles my mind that are now pro war. Mm-hmm. They're pro uh, medical tyranny. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're pro all kinds of evil things that are bad for them, bad for their health, bad for their community and culture. But yet now have totally forgotten about the you know what's really a problem yeah which is the debasement of the cult the the uh, currency, currency mm-hmm. and the you know Jack, this, house the house you know house situation but nobody's surprising. rebelling against that no, anymore no. because they get they got thrown a bone e michael jones says uh, he calls it de, uh in his book libido dominandi which translates to sexual liberation leads to uh slavery mm. essentially and so by giving these people and i would say a lot of this began in during the 1960s with the so-called you know, sexual revolution, where it was like these kids uh, who are now a bunch of spoiled brats that were raised by boomers, who if not given something to distract them, which you know, sex will always distract, um, may fight against or may speak up against or may uh, wanna do the right thing against the tyranny that's been unfolded upon them. And I think we've just taken it to the, to, to the, to the nth degree now mm-hmm. where sexual liberation isn't just about being uh, promiscuous, which it was back then, you know, the pill and, mm-hmm. you know, free love and whatnot, but it's now sexual liberation is, oh no, we're liberated to allow our children to change their sex or yes. to determine, their, determine their sex. Your talk was about uh, freedom of speech, and I want to circle back for a moment because you, you you mentioned some new words, newfangled words, words that just appeared on the scene. And uh, I do believe that uh, language is the battleground. Mm-hmm. Words are the battleground. They, are, I do believe that uh, they're more powerful than weapons. Mm. Freedom of speech has given us, uh, gotten us to a place where now the enemy is allowed to control the battlefield by 
controlling the conversation with made up words. Yesterday, you were being attacked by some of the protesting speakers uh, on different terms like cisgender. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, I was squirming my seat there because I, I, I mean, I saw you sweating a little bit. They, they were coming after you. Yeah. But my my opinion in that moment was they're not playing fair mm -hmm. because they now controlled the conversation by throwing fake words at you. Mm -hmm. uh, freedom of speech is allowing these people to create concepts or to blur definitions on various things, and I, in my opinion, and you know, I'll let you just kind of uh, kick this ball once I throw it at you, is that we have to reject even their words. Agreed. Like cisgender doesn't mean anything. No. Transgender doesn't actually mean anything. Mm -hmm. It's a new word that they made up so they can attack us in, a, in an emotional way. Mm -hmm. And did you hear what I answered? C go ahead, tell us. I said, what is the difference between a cisgender man and a transgender woman? Right. It, 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 it's a mind uh, puzzle. Right. And they can answer that. No, they can't. No. Right. They're confusing themselves yeah, with their so own Yeah, so I words. would never normally use the word cisgender because it's, right. it's a ridiculous word. That To me, the conversation is and, over once they start bringing up these newfangled words. Yeah, I, I and just... And it's all wrapped in this, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, facade of higher intellectual, uh, you know, uh, moral ground. Mm -hmm. That if you don't even know what these words are then maybe there's something wrong with you. But those are the very weapons that they're using. But these are the same people who would refuse to describe the word woman. Right. Or man. If I, Blurring ask, definition. You, you ask them so what freedom of is, speech, so. it, it, yeah. taken to this degree, mm -hmm. and, you know, why I push back a little bit with sure. freedom of speech, if we're on the same page. Yeah. But I think that there's limitations on it is they, sh you should not be allowed to, I mean, there needs to be a consensus mm -hmm. or a, 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 f a playing field for mm -hmm. us to play this game. And if you're so free in your speech to change definitions and mm -hmm. to make up words, then you're not playing by the rules. And so we need to uh, mm -hmm. silence that, in my opinion. That can't Sil happen. Silence it how? By saying that's not a real word. Okay. We okay. don't agree on the definition of this word. Therefore, mm -hmm. we don't have a conversation. Therefore, the conversation is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm, look, I'm, and to me, that's, if you're talking about doing it again through speech, to me, all of it happens through speech. On, on both sides of the aisle, I think the best way to combat these ideas is to use my freedom of speech, which they also want to curtail, to combat the ideas. I believe that my ideas are better than theirs. I believe my ideas are rooted in truth. I can explain. If you ask me what a woman is, I, I can explain. I can answer that question in two seconds, right? I can answer it with three words, an adult human female. That's what a woman is, right? right? That's a very clear definition. Mm-hmm. 99.9% .9 of people around the world totally understand it and agree with it. Everybody right. in history agrees with it. For us to agree be it. in conversation, we have to have playing rules. Yes, right? Every single person in this world was birthed by a woman. Every single person who exists was birthed by a woman. Everyone who existed in history, a woman is an adult human female. No man has ever, a male has never given birth in the human species ever. That's not a thing, right? It's a very clear definition. There is There's some stuff which is... Again, there are things which are more great. It's hard to find something more black and white and more objective than this simple biological fact. It's not just true of the human species. It's true across all animal species. So if you're going to tell me that you've got an someone's guy has an alternative definition for a woman, I'm like, okay, tell me what it is. And they're like, well, I, it's it's what I'm like, okay, well, I've given a definition. You won't even give a definition. I've win. And I think if you're in a room with 100 people or 1,000 people, mm -hmm. And one person has this very clear definition, which everyone understands and is what they believe most of their life. Uh, even the people who claim to not understand it or whatever, again, that's rooted in fear. They know what a woman is. They don't. They know. They just, they won't say it because if one of them were to say my answer, they're going to get attacked by their own team. Mm. Right? It's fear. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't know what a woman is. And I don't believe there's anyone who genuinely does not know a woman. You've all got mothers. Every single one of us has a mother. Right. right, who birthed us? So you know what a woman is, right? Some of those people literally they say, "You are a woman. You have your whole female reproductive. You've been a woman your whole life. You have a menstrual cycle, so on and so forth. You have the capacity to become pregnant. You have breasts. You have estrogen. Your body is built how it is. You know darn well what a woman is. You're just living in fear. You're acting in fear. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not worried about these people. Whilst yes, I. 
obviously take objection to people spreading nonsense or people like the word these days misinformation and disinformation like it's you so want to talk about misinformation i mean like, you want to talk misinformation right. i mean that's the epitome of misinformation but Absolutely. i'm not like i'm like i don't want to silence you i'll just tell you why you're wrong and you'll find very quickly it's, it's with that kind of thing it's not even really a debate because they don't have arguments their best thing is well you're transphobic I'm like, okay. What does that mean? Shrug. In other words, that's a yeah. fake. That's another one of those it's a, it's fake an, words. It's another fake words. And if you shrug at that, they don't have anything else in the chamber. That's like the final bullet that's supposed to make you go put you on the defensive. Right. And I'm just like, no, I just reject that. I mean, it was funny because yesterday you're looking at the signs. People, someone's holding up a sign saying, uh, "Trans lives matter." I'm like, yeah, I agree with you. However, someone identifies or feels, or I agree with you, their life matters. Like, you you think I'm in disagreement with that? Trans rights or human rights? Agreed. Of course, like you're, a, if you're a human being, and is it I support actually, your human rights. You know, it's fo so funny because it's all under this guise of uh, compassion. Mm -hmm. But is it compassionate to let someone to live in error, or is it true compassion to like? Do you really truly believe, uh, or that you have the best interest mm -hmm. for that person's life mm -hmm. if you let them continue to destroy it through yep. living and believing in this error, or is true compassion rebuking and telling you? No, yeah. this I'm, I, I have compassion for you so much so that I won't let you, I won't uh, pander to your uh, your error. Yeah, I, I would say, I would very much say the latter. And I think that this type of thinking, this is where the, the masculine energy, you mm. can see that there's uh, an absence of that. Because this whole line of thinking and the emotions and compassion and subjectivity over everything... You know, no, no disrespect to logical thinking women out there, but it's a very feminine way of thinking. And it's not by accident, by the way, that the majority of people who promote and support these things are women and girls. Right. And right? Very effeminate men. Yes, because they care more about other people's... They, they care more about being politically correct and not stepping on anyone's toes or even risking her harming anyone's feelings and so on. It's like, you know, when you get these... And See, that's okay. That's good for women to be that way. Yeah, it's but it has, it has to be balanced, right? It has to be balanced. I'm sure, you know, you have, you have children, you have a wife. I'm sure that the three way- three daughters. Yes. And I'm sure that the way you, you, you parent is not identical to the way your wife does. It's not in any couple. Typically, the man has a more masculine role, a bit more tough love. And the woman tends to be, you know, a bit more sensitive, a bit more compassionate, if you want to use that word coddle perhaps coddle the child a little bit more and be more averse to risk and them you know having their emotions or their physical safety put in any type of danger it tends to be dads who are pushing their kids more to right. you know the dad wants the child to play football the mom you know doesn't <laughs> the, mm -hmm. you know the the dad's happy with the child playing on that dangerous thing or going on that thrill ride or whatever and the mom tends to be a bit more uh, i don't know and when you have both of them yes you have a balance it's good yeah you have you have you have a balance um but we have a massive imbalance i mean the usa i believe has the highest rate of fatherlessness in the world right right the highest number of children or highest percentage of children growing up without a fatherly presence in the home and i think that now we're seeing decades later you're seeing the repercussions and the consequences of that on all sorts of different levels, not just on the, the obvious ones, but on these, these subtle levels where we've now moved, you know, emotions are trumping, are trumping objectivity and truth. It's interesting, you know, have you ever seen these, these shows like, what's it called, like My 600 Pound Life or whatever? And if you want to see a great example of this sort of toxic compassion um, or killing people with kindness, mm -hmm. Look at the people who are feeding these individuals. You've got someone who weighs 650 pounds and cannot move, cannot get out of bed, is going to die within a few years without intervention. And usually it's the mom who is continuing to feed them and make them all this. And what do they say? Oh, well, if I don't do I do it because I love them. If, uh, if he or she, you know, he or she will get angry right. if I don't do this. And so that's the, that's the almost... <laughs> People talk about toxic masculinity. If yeah. you, that, that's almost like the toxic femininity right. of yours. You won't just, you're so afraid of the tough love 
I would argue that the compassionate thing to do, the truly compassionate thing is to be like, no, you might want to eat 10 pizzas today. No, I'm not buying you 10 pizzas. By the way, you can't even get out of bed and chase me because you can't get out of bed. But you might hate me for the next few months, but you'll be thanking me at the end of this. I'm not going to let you die. I love you so much. I'm not going to let you die. I'm not going to let you kill yourself. You're addicted to heroin. I'm not going to be going out and buying you heroin and helping you inject it. To me, that's not compassion. That's not kindness. But for some people, depending on their personality type, they don't know when to draw that line. So they just keep appeasing, 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 supplicating people, even if it is enabling um, destructive, self-destructive behavior. And I think that's something that plays out in a lot of ways. And then I think on top of it, with a lot of the people who are, um, a lot of it is compassion. Uh, it's 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 narcissism masking as compassion mm -hmm. in a lot of these cases. When I see a lot of those young people there who are protesting or seeing what some people are doing online, offline, I'm like this is just narcissism. Right, they're the rudest people in the room. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, made me squirm in my seat once again when you were, were speaking was that, well, we had the the organizer of the event or I guess the um, the administrator mm. come up and he gave very clear boundaries about how we're going to do this. Yes. And of course, all of the silly kids were outside. They mm -hmm. didn't listen to any of that. Um, as soon as they came in the room, it was all chaos where the rules about speaking out were not being honored, mm -hmm. uh, the rules about getting in line in order to ask a question mm -hmm. uh, in, in an ordered way was completely thrown out. And it just seems as if the, the culture panders to a bunch of spoiled brats and it these does. kids are justified in their unruly behavior. Yes. And it's 100%, like you said, it's because it's, we live in a fatherless culture. You can tell that those people have not been told no before. Can't you tell? Like they've never had someone to say no, no, I'm not doing that. You can see because when you say no to them, how the dare you? The right. reaction is like you know they're like, oh, I want to be called my pronouns are Z, 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 Z. I'm not doing that. No. What? Like it? They they they're not even used to that. They're not even used to someone not indulging all of their fantasies and all of their delusions and all of their things. And it's pure narcissism. If I sit there and I say, I want to be referred to as, by the way, when I'm not even there, because you don't even, the funny thing with the pronoun thing is when you're talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you don't even use he, him, she, her. You, right. you call each other by your name or you say you. So you're discussing how you want people to talk about you in the third person or when you're not even in right. the room, right? If I say that, look, my preferred adjectives are uh, handsome, charming, and attractive, and when you refer to me, I want you to use those adjectives, and if you don't, then you're not being polite. Is that compassion or is that narcissism? That's me being a narcissist. That's me saying, I want to control your tongue and I want to be referred to in this very, very specific way. Even if I'm not even in the room, you talk about me, you've got to, you've got to use these adjectives, right? I want to be referred to as your highness or sir or lord right. or whatever it is, and you must, and I will get offended right. and yell at you if you don't abide by that. That is pure narcissism. Wanting to be a different gender other than man or woman, narcissism. You're not that special. No one is non-binary. You can't be. We are a sexually dimorphic species. We have male, we have female. You are a he or you are it's a, a she. It's a made up word. There's, no, there's nothing else outside that. If you want to be, well, I'm whatever, I'm like, no. I'm not doing that. I'm not playing that game. If I, you know, I'm not trying to force you to indulge in any, so like, no. And yeah, sure, other people might play along with that and that's also their own liberty. But you can't expect everyone in the world and you're going to have a real rude awakening. <laughs> mm -hmm. if, oh, you yeah. go, if you go into the true world and you're expecting everybody in all these different cities and countries and around the world to, to pander to your pronouns and your made up gender or whatever, you're better off having me coming to un university and telling you that's not going to happen than going out there and having to deal with this in reality because it's going to be a real rude awakening, you know. And as they say, you know, prepare the prepare the child for the road. Don't prepare don't prepare the road for the child. And you can't you can't nerf the world. I think that's just one reality. Yes, we don't want the world to be more physically dangerous and risky than it needs to be, but also the world does have danger in it physical danger, mental danger, spiritual danger, um, emotional danger. But the best thing I think you can do is to 
give people, especially if you're a, a parent or you're an older person, give young people the tools that they need to deal with that, right? Not just scream and cry when something is a challenge or something, you know, makes them feel a certain way or whatever, but to be resilient enough and strong enough to, I mean, if I were as feeble-minded as the people protesting me yesterday, I wouldn't have even been able to speak. I would have seen signs. Oh, someone's got that sign. Oh, they're, they're yelling. Like I, I, I'm now breaking down on stage and I'm crying because I'm not strong enough and emotionally resilient enough to handle the fact that, oh, okay, there's some people here who don't like me or there's some people here asking me some tough questions or who have misconceptions about me. or this, and, and I'm massively outnumbered. There's like 40 of them and there's one of me, right? If I were not emotionally resilient and I were not strong and I hadn't been raised in a way to deal with that, I wouldn't have been able to deal with it. So I'm like, cool, I want to give you young people in this room, whether you're 18 or you're 20 or you're 25, I want to help give you the tools to deal with that and to be able to speak eloquently and articulate your ideas and also to be able to listen to things that you disagree with and not have a conniption and uh, be able to, yeah. you know, keep your emotions, <laughs> you know, keep your emotions in check and use logic and use reason. If someone says something that's you don't think makes sense or you don't think is right instead of just snapping or getting angry speaking out speak. being out of order yeah just like be able to explain and say okay well i hear what you're saying but you know this is what what about this perspective or this is the way i look at it and so on and you know we're not all gonna agree on everything that's never gonna happen but we all need to be able to coexist ultimately so i very much push for even if people aren't gonna agree with everything and i don't people do i don't expect anyone to agree with everything i say but even if we have different views and perspectives and experiences, we can still be kind, polite, civil, get on with each other, have empathy for one another, look out for one another. And ultimately, that's a real core part of my message. Zubi, we run up on time here. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you, man. This has been amazing. Great conversation, bro. Thanks, we could man. go on for another <laughs> hour. I mean, you're nailing it. But before we wrap up, uh, what do you got in the pipeline? Anything new going on? Anything that uh, people should know about or where they can learn more about you and what you're doing, bro? Yeah, sure. Well, I have a lot of stuff that's out there right now. Of course, all of my music, I've got nine albums and EPs available on iTunes and Spotify and everywhere else. If you just search my name, Zuby, Z-U-B-Y, you can find my music on any platform. I have my own podcast, Real Talk with Zuby. Done over 200 episodes now. It comes out every week. That's available on same platforms as well as on YouTube. I've got two books out there, a children's book called The Candy Calamity, as well as a book for grown-ups called Strong Amazing. Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody. So those are both about getting your mind and your body in order. And then, of course, I'm on all social media as well, at Zuby Music, Z-U-B-Y Music, same handle on every channel. I got to say, once again, man, you're a light in this dark age, brother. Thank you, bro. And so it's amazing to see you using all your gifts to bless this world. Thank you once again. Check out Zuby and stay tuned for the next show. That's it, yo.